great thing about them coming up here is you get to learn more about marriage and hear less from me. So everyone give a hand for Bob and Darlene. Thanks so much, Taylor. Welcome, everybody. Oh, my. I might be having a nightmare. <laughs> There's way too many of you here. We are really so glad. Oh, hey, Char. No, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're so glad that you are all here. And if you would, would you just take a second and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father. God, we ask you to just come and come strongly and thickly in this room. We know, Bob and I know, that this is a talk that you wrote. So I'm just going to ask that even as we get started, you would just help us to fade away and help these amazing couples just hear from you. God, I just pray for some protection. There's somebody here that's coming in, not doing so well. So I'm going to ask for protection around them. I'm going to ask for protection around this talk, that it doesn't become something that causes fights, but that this is the beginning and the start of healing for them. So, Father, let's just have some fun. Do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, for those of you who are not familiar with us, and you're visiting, we're on staff here at Plymouth Covenant. Bob's the pastor to adults, and I happen to be the women's ministry director but the thing we absolutely love to do is because we get to do it together is marriage ministry. We love it. We have been married, get this, for 33 years. 1985 was the jam, people. I'm telling you. <laughs> Not only that, but we actually started in ministry right as we got married. Did I see Jake and Chloe here? Hey, wave at us. These two, this is our new associate worship pastor, just started, right? And how many days have you been married? 15 <laughs> days. <laughs> oh, we didn't get it right. First lesson of the night, Jake. Get Let's used get to that. You'll, you'll be okay, you Chloe, how many days have you been married? Sorry, Zoe. I had a, sorry, I had a bl brain blip. Oh, Sorry. Three weeks. Nice. So you were six days off? <laughs> okay, we got to work on that, Jake. Okay. We used to look like them, Bob. I was 20 when we got married. Welcome to your future. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot to look forward to. Before we say anything else, truly, you guys need to hear me say we are not perfect, and we do not have the perfect marriage. In fact, if some of you had overheard our fights in the most painful seasons of our life, it would have been painful for you to listen to. I know it was hard for us to go through. You know, you'll hear our more in-depth testimony if you come to re-engage our marriage program on Sunday night, so we're not going to give you all those details in that story here tonight. But what you need to know is that we have a real passion to help couples that struggle. And that passion, and not, even, not only that, but not just couples that struggle, but just marriages in general. Like, you don't have to be struggling. We would love to cheer you on. Because even if you're doing well, you can still do better. You know, that passion that we have is born out of our own struggles. And our own inability to connect in those times in our marriage. This is really important. Hear this. Struggle is real. If you're married, you need to know, I, I would even say, struggle is even normal. Now, it has varying degrees. Sometimes it's just over the minor stuff. Sometimes it's over the bigger stuff. But every single person sitting in these seats, except for those that are engaged, you may not have reached this point yet, but every single couple in here has had a struggle. That's normal. But in these seasons, both good and bad, in all the years that we have been married, we can honestly say today, this is our best year we've ever had. And every year is getting better and better. 
we're at that point. By the way, let me just pause for a second here. I need to give credit where credit is due. Bob would not have three quarters of the material that he writes and shares on relationships especially if he hadn't been needing to deal with me <laughs> for 33 years. I am the inspiration. Put a face to that. And you're welcome. Tonight, we want to share some of the best principles that have helped us the most. The first principle actually comes from Reengage, that program that meets on Sunday nights, and it's actually made a huge difference in our, in our marriage. I absolutely wish I had known this when we were your age, when we first started, because it is amazing. Here's the principle. What it says is draw a circle around yourself and work on everyone inside the circle. Let that sink in, okay? This is not easy. I want you to hear that too. This is not an easy thing to do. It is in our natural sin human nature to go, it's your fault. You did it wrong. It takes practice to get to the point where you can draw that circle around yourself and go, ooh, I did it wrong. If you come to re-engage, it's a great place. You will have a lot of practice doing it there. So do not leave this room tonight thinking, you should have that down by now. It's not going to happen in one day. This is something that takes time and practice to do. But let me tell you, if you get to that point where that becomes the new normal for you, it is a marriage game changer. It's so easy to focus on our partner as the problem. It's just natural to do that. It's got to be your fault. It can't be me. But the power actually comes in being able to change yourself because you sure don't have power to change your spouse. Here's how we're going to use it tonight. Now, you all should have gotten a scorecard as you walked in, so take that out. Do not fill it out yet. What I want you to do is take this and see that big black circle up in the top? Put your personal name inside of that circle. If this you don't have one, raise your hands because yeah, you're yeah. going to need it. There's a couple up front here. Um, this is what we're going to do tonight, okay? So for me, this would say, once I wrote, wrote my name in there, Darlene's scorecard. This is an interactive talk tonight. We want you guys to participate, but this scorecard is for you not for your spouse. So when you're filling this out, and I don't want you to fill it out until we come to it, we'll prompt you when it's time. Do not look at your spouse's paper and go, mm, that's what you put? I don't think so. <laughs> this really is for you, okay? So from the very start of this, I want you to be thinking, I'm drawing that circle around myself, and I'm going to work on everyone inside the circle. Good job. Yeah. Um, when your spouse says the words, we need to talk, what comes to your mind? Are your thoughts filled with fear, anxiety, and dread? Or do you anticipate a fun conversation that will produce meaningful results? We know communication is not easy, but we passionately believe that you can navigate difficult topies, topics if you bridge the gap if you have a bridge that will help you cross the great divide. Um, we communicate well when we're connected and poorly when we're not. I want us to slow down for just a second. We communicate well when we're connected and poorly when we're not. When you lose connection, intimacy fades, conflict increases, negative feelings take over. When you're connected, life is fun. You give each other the benefit of the doubt and you get the opportunity to clarify. I don't know about the rest of you, but I make all kinds of mistakes and say things wrongly often. What this represents right here is the great divide. It's like a chasm between relationships. Um, and we're going to talk about tonight that the connection that you have is the bridge that will help you to cross the great divide. Some of you, it seems like this. There are some of you that are in here and you don't have very much connection and it doesn't really work too well. There was times in our marriage where 
the simplest conversation about schedules would end up in a massive fight and we would argue and we would not even be able to talk to each other. Sometimes the chasm was so big that it needed to go all the way across the room. Other times the chasm was so big it was like here all the way to Vicksburg. It was a, a massive chasm in between us. Some of you are hanging on by a thread and you don't want to in, enter difficult conversations. In fact, just the thought of difficult conversations for you is like I have no idea what's going to happen and I am terrified that things are not going to go very well. What we're going to talk about today is that your connection is the bridge that makes it possible for you to be able to cross that great divide. Uh, what causes a divide? There are several things that cause it. First of all, it's unique personality. It's the different preferences that we have. It's the different family of origin. I want you to know um, that if Darlene and I chose to go any place on the planet, we would take an entirely different route there. If Every we were time. on our way to Cub, I'm positive we would go in a way that it's, uh, the, let's just say that the way I choose would not <laughs> be the way that she would choose. Let's just, can I add one more thing there, Bob? Sure. Like literally, both of us getting out of the car, walking to the same place, we get out different ways. We are that opposite. There have been times where I've tried to anticipate which way she's going to go. I have yet to get it right. I like to keep him guessing. <laughs> you, you're Here's pretty good mystery. at that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you add gender differences, uh, does anybody know that men and women are different? Uh, the <laughs> fact that we're sinful, selfish, and broken people adds an entirely different complexity to it. What is connection? When you think about connection, um, it has to do with an internal feeling that your spouse is present, available, receptive. Every time you're talking to your spouse, there's a conversation going on under the surface. And what you're asking is, are you available? Are you receptive? Do you care? Are you listening? If you're connected, you know that your spouse is there for you, and you can trust them with your heart. The person that I care the most about is there for me. We realize that some of you have an extremely strong connection and others of you, you're hanging on by a thread. And what we want to do throughout the night is not to point out how bad it is, but what we want to do is give you practical tools that will help you to be able to cross the great divide. There are several ways that you can do that. And uh, as we start by talking about connection, it's crucial that you understand that there are things that you can do that make your connection better. And the first one is playful interaction. Um, laughter, fun, and play will bring delight to your relationship. Fun is essential to intimacy. How often do you laugh? I want you to think about this just for a second. How many times have you laughed just this week? Proverbs chapter 17, 12 says this. Laughter is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Connection is the glue that holds everything together. When you have fun together, you are building positive memories. So set aside some time, and we're going to give you some tools to be able to come up with creative dates. But couples that play together will stay together. Another way to connect is intentional positive thoughts. Here's what I mean by that. When you choose to think, when you choose to think about good things about your partner, then you will feel optimistic about each other and your marriage. Just think about this for a second. If you were going to meet a friend that you see all the time, you know this friend really well, you were going to meet them for lunch, and your friend knew that your time was going to be short, so your friend went ahead and ordered lunch for you. But when you got there, your burger had mayonnaise on it, and you hate mayonnaise. Would you say to that friend, <clears throat> You are so selfish and inconsiderate that you did not remember how I take my burger. Really? You wouldn't do that with your friend, would you? This, for me, is something that's really important. Um, probably as a woman, my emotions can sometimes amp up my bad thoughts about... About me? Yeah. You, honey. And if those emotions take over, it's not good. So me staying in my circle, I have to think 
If I'm getting to that point, I have to go in the other room. Uh, it's just like, just give me a second. I'll be back in a second. And here's what that probably looks like when I go into the other room. <clears throat> he needs so much help. <clears throat> okay, okay, intentional positive thoughts. He is kind. He is smart. He is important. Didn't that come from like a movie? Yeah, like I think the help? So. I think it might have been the help. Um, but truly. Does that mean I need help? <laughs> Um, I'll plead the fifth. Okay. Um, no, staying in my circle. I don't know. You can only answer that for yourself. I need help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this sounds awkward, and you're probably going, yeah, whatever. But really, th it really does work. If you can just separate for a second and start thinking some positive things, positive things like this is the man I stood next to 33 years ago and absolutely loved. I need to watch what I'm saying, and I need to watch what I'm thinking about him. That's pretty cool. Uh, the opposite is true as well. If you go in the other room and start thinking about all the awful things that your spouse has done, and then you try to have a conversation, I can virtually guarantee it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, some people are able to build connection by shared experience, and for them, they do it by praying together or worshiping together or reading the Bible together or doing something or experiencing their kids, going to their kids' games or watching them do something, shared experience is awesome. But I want to talk a little bit about physical intimacy. Bob, do you mean sex? <laughs> I, I, that's what I mean. I thought that's what you meant. Did you know that God's the author of sex and it's an incredible gift that was designed specifically to help bond husbands to their wives? Men often become emotionally connected after they're physically close. But often for women, if they have physical uh, connection or physical intimacy, when they don't have emotional intimacy, it makes them feel unloved, unimportant, and devalued. I don't want to go too fast because I, I want us to just consider the differences between men and women for just a second. It's important that you're emotionally connected. If sex is difficult, please don't just let that go to the side. It, there's all kinds of different options. We have a ministry here called Awaken Love with Ruth and Jim Busis, and that would be something. Or you might want to go to a counselor, but sex is way too good to not have that as part of your experience. I know it's difficult to talk about sex, and it makes some people uncomfortable just because we've said the word. Some of you are not listening to us, and you're All wondering. All the guys are listening. You think they are? Oh, yeah. Okay. They're with you. <laughs> Maybe the one that's uncomfortable talking about sex is me. <laughs> but uh, one thing that we are very comfortable doing and one thing that we really like to do is go to movies. And I want to quote you a line from one of my favorite movies. It's by a guy named Chris Pratt in a movie called Jurassic World. Like the first one that was done, not this last one. That one was a disappointment, that one. That one was So was like awful. the first one of that movie. Okay. In the first movie with Chris Pratt in there, he has a statement and he says, it's not about control, it's about relationship. He tells her, he says, you made the animals in a test tube, but they don't know that. They are thinking, you got to eat. You gotta hunt. You gotta, and then he does this. Bob, it's more like this. You gotta use the face too. <laughs> I, I definitely right? missed that one. <laughs> uh, you can work on improving your communication skills all you want, but until you improve your connection, you will not be able to traverse the great divide. Connection is the bridge. And the way that you listen to your partner will either cause damage and make things worse or improve and strengthen your connection. If you're careful, if you're not careful, you can destroy your connection just simply by the way that you listen to your spouse. I want to read a section of scripture here as soon as I can get it open. Out of James chapter 1, and as soon as I can get it open, we're going to read from verse 19 doesn't usually take me this long <laughs> to find it. I'm close. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger never produces the righteous life that God desires. 
The first way that you can destroy your connection, and I'm not uh, exaggerating when I use this word destroy, not only going to cause damage, but if you don't listen well to your spouse, you will destroy the connection, and it will make it almost impossible for you to have good communication in the future because your connection is the bridge that makes it possible for you to cross that great divide. If you want to break down communication, then here's what you do. You point out any factual inaccuracies or incorrect statements. If the marriage team would hand out the blue sheets, that would help it so that you guys don't have to take notes and you can just pay attention to what we're saying. Show your spouse what really happened by questioning every detail. Convince them that they misunderstood you and unfairly assigned you wrong motives. You will damage your spouse anytime you say any words like this. No, that is not true. I don't agree. Or one that I was pretty good at. I did not do that. Take your uh, score sheets, and I, what I want you to do is be honest with yourself for just a minute. So as you look at your score sheets, the, there'll be an order of the points that we give, and I want you to rate, are you excellent at it? Are you good? Are you poor? Be honest with that. How are you doing when it comes to you arguing the facts? So if you excel at it and you're awesome at it, you should put down that you're excellent there. So another way you can destroy the connection, remember it's the bridge, this is another way you can destroy it. If I had a hammer, I'd be beaten on this thing. So another way you can do that is by denying their experience. This may be done by denying, minimizing, ridiculing, ignoring, or judging your spouse's feelings or perceptions. Whenever you invalidate someone's emotional experience, you do damage to the relationship because you leave them feeling unheard, abandoned, and alone. Be careful not to dismiss, devalue, disregard, or criticize their emotional experience. You do this by letting them know that they have no right to feel the way they do. Some damaging things you can say there are, you're all worked up for no reason. It's not that bad. No reasonable person would come to that conclusion. So on your scorecard, now score under, deny their experience. Are you excellent at it? Excellent. If you're poor, poor. Another way that you can destroy your connection is to undermine their meaning. Question their logic. Dismantle their conclusions. Make sure that you make it a point to tell them that they made a mountain out of a molehill. Only listen to them so that you can make an effective rebuttal and undercut their arguments. Focus your attention on what you want to say so that you can make your point and get your perspective across. Let them know that no one else in the entire world would have that irrational feeling. Um, I actually said that once. <laughs> Damaging things you can say. That's ridiculous. You're crazy and one that will never work. Here we go again. Okay, record, record your, score. How, your score. How do you do about undermining the meaning? Okay, so now on your blue sheet, flip it over. We're now on the side that says listen to strengthen. Just as you can listen in a way that will destroy this connection bridge, you can listen in ways that will help build it up and strengthen it. The first way you can do that is to care about the person. Listen by giving them your full attention, which includes facial expressions, eye contact, and body position. Guys, really you need to hear this. It is so important. You might be watching every detail of that football game, and hear everything your wife says that you can say back to her. But if you're looking at the game and not focused in on her, what you have communicated is not that you got the message, but that you don't care. Let them know that you're for them and what they have experienced matters. By so I just want to oh, make sure. sure I get this straight. So if you're talking and I grimace like I'm in a lot of pain, that's not good? That's really not good. I will leave and go in the other room. He is kind. He's smart. <laughs> I've done that before, too. <laughs> I've got lots of practice. No, so do you. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, but by being compassionate and having an interested attitude, helpful things you can say here are thank you for telling me about. I think I heard you say and then repeat what they said. That sounded important. Would you go over that again? So now take your scorecard, you're going to score under, 
care about the person in the listen to strengthen area. Uh, another area to strengthen is to acknowledge their experience. Value and appreciate their emotional experience. You convey genuine interest in what they are saying. People feel heard when their emotional experience is validated. Whenever a person thinks or feels is their reality, your spouse is entitled to have feelings and thoughts, however foreign or unusual they may seem to you. Accept their internal experience as understandable. That does not mean that you agree with them. What you're saying is that I'm okay with you having that experience. Identify the emotion they're feeling and demonstrate the valid aspects of their experience. There is something powerful about having our inner worlds heard and understand. Helpful things that you can say. I can see how you feel that way. You don't have to agree with it to acknowledge the parts of it that you can validate. That makes sense. Wow. No wonder. Okay, score yourself. How do you do at acknowledging your spouse's experience? Another way you can listen to strengthen is to understand their perspective. Try and see where they're coming from and name what they are feeling. Put yourself in their shoes and try to see things from their perspective. If you're able to identify what a person is feeling, then they will leave the encounter believing that this person gets me. And he has my best interests at heart. He does, by the way. Oh, thanks, Lynn. <laughs> Some helpful things you can say here. Let me see if I got this right. I really want to understand what you're saying. Okay, go ahead and score yourself under understand their perspective. You're getting the hang of that, right? I, I want to slow down for just a second here because there's something that we're tempted to do is we're tempted to speed up the process and comfort somebody's pain before they feel heard. If you ever try to comfort somebody's pain before they feel heard. Whoops. Wait, wait, wait. That Let me help was you. Pain. We've, um, we've had a catastrophe. I so excited that <laughs> uh, my head thing came I don't know where off. this goes for you. Probably around my belt. There you go, hon. I That's, got you. Thank you. I That's what you. happens when you talk fast <laughs> and you move around. <laughs> this is, if you don't know me, this is about as still as I've ever been before. <laughs> that is true. Um, if you try to comfort somebody's pain before they feel heard, the, the only thing they're going to think is that you're just saying to them, can we move on, please? And it will not work. You have to first listen and receive what they say before you respond to it. Give them a soothing response that relaxes, reassures, and consoles. Helpful things that you can say is, that had to be really hard. Is there anything that I can do to help? Just like it's important what we, how we listen because we can either cause damage and destroy or we can build into somebody and make things better, it's important how we talk. Can I just say, um, guys, would you hand out the green handout? Sorry for all the handouts. No, I'm not sorry, actually. We kind of promised you you'd take some things with you, so that's why you're getting it. We want you to have some actionable things um, as you leave tonight. For me, it took me probably 10 years of trying to understand this before I was getting better at it. <laughs> and some of you are much quicker than me, and you can pick it up almost instantaneously, but it takes more than just going over it once to be able to do it in a way that builds your connection. Um, did you know that you can destroy your spouse with your words? Did you know that if you're not careful, with a couple sentences, you can hurt your spouse so deeply that they will not want to spend any time in your presence. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, we read, Reckless words pierce like a sword. Words in the hands of a careless or angry spouse can cut like a knife and do a great deal of harm. In James chapter 3, verse 8, he says that the tongue is a restless evil 
full of deadly poison. He goes on to say that it, even though it's a little spark, it can burn down an entire forest. The words you use are important. We can do damage with our words. A few inconsiderate words can deeply wound your spouse. Whenever you attack your spouse without respect for their feelings, you are destroying the bridge and doing damage to not only your relationship now, but your ability to communicate in the future. So so the first of the three ways that can absolutely destroy and how you can talk to destroy, the first one is criticism. Pointing out your spouse's mistakes or highlighting their faults. Focusing your attention on what they have done wrong or failed to do. Whenever you point out mistakes, you communicate your disappointment, disapproval, and disgust. Go ahead and score yourself. And be honest. Score check. Another way to destroy your connection is character assassinations. Making a personal attack on your spouse's looks, weight, intelligence, or character I want to slow down and just be tender with you for a second, okay? If you attack your spouse's looks, weight, intelligence, or character, you will cause severe damage. And even though you said it in a fight, and even though you might not have meant it, your spouse might not be able to forgive or even let it go. So I want to encourage you to be careful before you attack someone's weight or intelligence or looks or character. Go ahead, score yourself. How are you doing on character assassination? The third way you can talk to destroy is threats and ultimatums. Promising painful consequences unless your spouse gives in to your demands and changes their behavior. Making threats and issuing ultimatums can cause tremendous damage. Threats of abandonment, I want a divorce, can be devastating. Milder forms of that could be like, I am done. Why do I bother? Words like that can even um, bring terror to your spouse's soul. And I don't say that lightly, I mean that. Go ahead and score yourself. In threats and ultimatums. You can cause severe damage with your words, but you can strengthen your marriage in unbelievable ways by using your words to speak life-giving words. Be generous with your compliments and positive emotions. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says this, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Okay, I'm going to give you what to practically do. If you see your spouse doing something well, acknowledge it. Okay, this is really hard, okay? When you see your spouse doing something well, point it out. This would include even when your spouse loads the dishwasher and he doesn't load it the way you do. I'm so grateful he did it, right? Thank you for loading the dishwasher. You did that, by the way. Thank you. That's mostly good. Thank you. (laughs) It'll pay off, I promise. Cool. Uh, (laughs) Affirming words can build confidence, renew hope, and restore purpose to a spouse that feels discouraged, overwhelmed, or unimportant. Encouraging words in the hand of a skillful surgeon can be a scalpel that can do tremendous good. So make your home a place where appreciation, affection, and approval are freely spoken. Words that are affirming motivate your spouse to come near you. Words that are accepting invite your spouse to share. Words that are forgiving release your partner to admit their failure. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, we read, read, read these words. Do not let any unwholesome talk, I, I want to make sure you catch that, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Every one of our words that come out of our mouth should be helpful for building up our spouse's needs, that it may benefit those that listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Please catch this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, 
brawling, slander, and every other form of malice. And malice is wanting bad things to happen to your spouse. The reason often that we say such hurtful words is because we haven't got the bitterness and the resentment out of our hearts. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in God forgave you. The reason we talk nice to our spouse isn't because they deserve it. It's because that's how God would talk to us. Wow, I'm kind of worked up here. (laughs) Um, Score yourself. How are you doing? Do you speak life-giving words? Is that something you excel at? Second way that you can talk to strengthen is to prioritize each other's well-being. The greatest gift you can give your spouse is to learn how to share your negative emotions in constructive and honoring ways. That's a good one for me. Conversation can become a door to incredible intimacy. Conversation can. If you're willing to value your partner more than making your point or winning the argument. If you're not already doing it, underline that sentence. Be careful that your passion to get your partner to see your point does not override your compassion for your spouse. Make sure at the end of the conversation you communicate the most important message. I care about you. You matter. You matter. You're important to me. I am important. I love you. Not I am disgusted with you and you never measure up to my expectations. Mm. Psalm 141.3 says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. This has so much power. There are two questions that you can ask yourself, and they're not easy to ask yourself. But the questions are, what message do I want to leave my spouse with after the conversation? This has to do with motive. Another question you can ask yourself, do my words communicate my dissatisfaction, disapproval, or rejection? Or do I leave them feeling important, valued, and respected? If you're good at prioritizing, give yourself an excellent. If you're not, you know what to do. Another way that you can strengthen your connection is to learn how to state your complaints in the form of a doable request. You have to take time to discover what you want and learn how to ask for it. Making a request doable can be challenging because you have to discover what you really want and state it in a way that your spouse could respond even if they want to. It is helpful if you give a straightforward description of the situation you want to address. You have to leave out the analysis, interpretation, and blaming language. Try and make it as specific kind and objective as possible. Oftentimes, the things we say to our spouse, they have no idea what to do. But if we learn how to make a request, it gives our partners a chance. Let me give you some examples of the difference between a complaint and a doable request. Here's a complaint. You never prioritize me and everyone else comes before me. If you said that to your spouse, they'd have no idea what to do. What if you said, would you be willing to go on a date with me sometime in the next two weeks? A complaint. I might as well be a single parent because I have to do everything. A dual request is, tomorrow morning, could you help me dress our son? A complaint. You are inconsiderate and messy. That's from me, by the way. I am that. I tend to have, I've said that a few, maybe a thousand times. Sorry, honey. I think it's probably in the (laughs) 900s. A doable request. I would really like it if you could put the dirty dishes in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Score yourself. That's the last thing that you have to score yourself for tonight. Okay, so while you have your scorecard in your hand, now that you've done and given yourself, put an X in one of those boxes, here's what you do with it. In each section, you'll see there's a white line that says total. So for each section, I want you to put a total at the bottom. So for example, if you have one excellent, one good, and one poor, and listen to strengthen, then you put one, one, and one. Or if you have two excellents, two, one, zero, okay? 
So do that in each one of those sections. Now that you have your score, you know what you need to work on. I want to let you know that research has shown that when you experience negative feelings or hurtful words, they go to a different part of your brain. In order to stay even or have your connection remain the same, you have to say at least five times as many positive words as you say negative words. I want to make sure we catch this, okay? If you just want to stay with your present connection, you have to say five times as many positive words as you say negative ones. And that's just to stay the same. And the same is true when it comes to listening. When your spouse is talking, you have to receive them five times before you block them once just to stay the same. Can I just, like, so truly I'm a visual person. You should be able to look at this and go, wow, my negatives are outweighing my positives by a lot. Or I'm even. Or maybe I'm more, like, this is the visual for you to go, I've got more. Ooh, if it's, like, five times, I might have to do some math here. Some of you might be realizing why you're having such a hard time communicating. Some of you might be realizing that you don't have the connection to be able to traverse the great divide. Right now, we want you to grab your orange sheets on the way out in just They're a out second. They're in the back. They look like and this. find a place where you can talk to your spouse for about 20 minutes or so. The sheet is designed to improve your connection. So find a place in the church where you can be alone. But wait, 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 wait. You be alone, but none of this, okay? We have security cameras. <laughs> That's later. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I I'm threw totally them off. Speechless. I love it. <laughs> I don't even know where I was. Uh, <laughs> find your place to be alone, okay? Uh, but when you did it, to me earlier, it was about the facial expression, wasn't it? When you kind of go like this, you have to go, okay. Uh, you don't brilliant. have to answer all of the questions, okay? And this is not designed to shame you in any way, but it's designed to give you a way to move forward so that you can establish your connection. Okay, um, do your best to try to be done answering the questions with each other at about 8.15 because we have some really cool desserts and they're very tasty. So we're going to meet in the Turtle Lake Cafe at 8.15. But before you go, I want to take a second and just pray for you, okay? Dear God, my heart for everyone in this room is that we would have an incredible connection the kind that you want us to have with you and with each other. God, I know that there's some couples in this room that are struggling. And it's hard to have conversations because everything gets interpreted negatively and they don't have the ability to give each other the benefit of the doubt or to even redirect or clarify. But God, I pray that moving forward, we would be able to build such a strong connection that we can communicate about everything that we're going to need to moving forward. God, I pray that these people here would be able to connect with their spouses. God, I pray that their marriages would reflect who you want us to be. Thank you, God, for giving us each other and for giving us a church where people care about marriages. I pray, God, that as they go together to talk with their spouses, it wouldn't do damage. But they would listen and they would talk to each other in ways that would build and strengthen their connection. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. P.S. God, please bless the food when we get it. Uh, have <laughs> great conversations and go find a place where you can be alone. Some of you could go in the balcony and we have all over the room. Spread out. But do not go past 815 because you're not going to want to miss dessert. Thanks for coming, everybody.